stuff. So they're going to be here any minute, and then we're going to start. What I love about Olivia is before I even announce her, she gets a standing ovation. Not a lot of people can get a standing ovation before you announce for you. You. All right, we'll be back. I'm going to start yelling at whenever I need them to listen to me. I'm going to say, Olivia Chow, and you know, instead of being like a teacher and doing that, my code word with you class is Olivia Chow. Um, here we are. It's a packed house. You all, wow, this is amazing. Uh, it's such a beautiful venue. Uh, you guys are beautiful folks. You've braved the cold. You've braved this city. And here you are to celebrate My Journey by Olivia Chow. <laughs> my name is Zay uh, I'm your sort of MC host. I'll be taking you in and out of the journeys that you're going to go through with us. Uh, we've got a lot of good stuff on tap. Uh, we've got performances, spoken words, a little bit of hip hop. We've got Suki and Lee and Olivia hanging out, chatting. Uh, and then we've got all sorts of good things planned for you. But what I want to tell you right now is that um, this event is being brought to you by Harper Collins and Another Story Bookshop. So let's give them a hand. We all know Another Story Bookshop, leading historical social justice bookshop online in Ronsi, Roncesvalle. Uh, go for, yeah, another book story, another story bookshop.ca. Follow them, buy books from them, keep them alive, keep our industry alive. But, it's a plea. It's an invitation, an encouragement, and it's a plea. Let's keep it alive here in this great city, in this great country. Um, Okay, so I'm going to introduce, moving right along, I'm going to introduce our first uh, performer. Her name is Shukri Duale. Yeah. 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 A little bio for her. She's a young Somali lady who grew up in one of Toronto's high priority neighborhoods, the Lawrence Heights community. Shukri is an aspiring writer, began to write as a means to understand herself and where she stood in society. Over the past several years, Shukri has been involved with social issues and problems which impact society. She's advocated for literacy, youth, homelessness, sexual awareness, and racial issues. I'm speaking to all of you here, I guess. You're all seeing me. Um, uh, aside from her passion to help others, she's also involved in the arts. The arts have provided, provided Shukri a stage to be political, we know that word in this city, and challenge the status quo to give attention to social issues, the importance of self-actualization and identity. Here she is, Shukri Duale. Thank you for coming out and supporting this amazing woman on her new book titled My Journey. I'm also sharing the stage with my beautiful friend, Nareema Hassan, also known as Ms. Bull. We're gonna get right to it. It's, um, it's called Triggers. The triggers, the triggers, the triggers. Everywhere I go, I'm reminded by the triggers, a state that I've risen from. But every time I see a young person panhandling in the streets, begging for some change to eat, I recall the trying times, the desperate cries, the suffocation, the taunts. I'm reduced back to a state that I've risen from. The triggers, the triggers, the triggers. In the downtown core, Everywhere I go, I'm reminded about the triggers. She said, let me bring you back to a state. When I had no ambitions of being great, I was just another girl going through the motions of life. Then life knocked me down on my knees. It was a bloody scene straight from a horror flick. Except it was her life and not a movie, so she was living it. She spoke about the unexpected glow that transformed the world that she knows. She was crashing fast. She was crashing fast without a friend who truly understands. Because how could she say that it was a father who put her in this helpless state? It was pathetic, so she carried the shame. The triggers, the triggers, the triggers. Everywhere I go, I'm reminded about the triggers. A state that I'm risen from, but every time I see a young person panhandling in the streets, begging for some change to eat, I recall the trying times, the desperate cry, the suffocation, the taunts. I'm reduced back to the state that I'm risen from. The triggers, the triggers, the triggers. In the downtown court, Everywhere I go, I'm reminded by the triggers. Where her fear had her head bleeding.
from destructing, see, homelessness brought up the fear that she was hiding, but what about the suicidal that came after? Kind of messed up that part. <laughs> Thank you. 
tonight. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, bios here to share with you now. These two, for me, are pretty famous, so uh, I know a lot of this stuff. I'm sure you do too, that's why you're here. So I'm going to skip along, but if I don't mention something uh, or that you guys are really aware of, don't boo me. Just know that I'm just trying to get them on stage because you don't need to hear me talking about them. You need to hear them talk to each other. So, uh, exactly. Uh, Suki so Lee, Canadian filmmaker, you all know, musician, actor, visual artist, radio, TV, broadcaster, DNTO on CBC Radio 1. Yeah, definitely not the actor. Um, former Much Music DJ host, a filmmaker extraordinaire, a photographer extraordinaire. She's exhibited, she's been to Cannes, she's been everywhere. She'll be speaking to Olivia, who is. Uh, you know, I think she's, uh, she, she writes things, I think. Uh, she's a writer, she's a politician, she's a motivator, she's an immigrant, uh, she's a champion for so many causes, and most of all for me, she's a Torontonian, which means so much. She's going to tell you about her journey, you don't need to hear me do the bio, guys, get up here, do your thing, it's amazing. Before my journey spans from your childhood in Hong Kong, your move to Toronto as a teenager, your family hardships, your political evolution, your career highlights, and what is most striking to me reading your memoir is just how revealing you were about your personal life, about your spiritual life. And we only have 40 minutes today to talk, so I really wanted to sort of cut to the chase and really focus on how the personal is political for you. So let's start uh, in your childhood. Uh, you were born in a middle class family in Hong Kong, and in the book you describe your child self as naughty, spoiled, rebellious, and lazy. <laughs> and you also flunked grade three. So what happened? It takes time to fail grade three, you know? It's not easy to fail grade three. I, it's true. I think there was 35 people in that class. I came in 34. Um, you left you behind. Yeah, yeah, of course, I got left behind. But anyway, so I switched school from another one school to another school. Um, I was just rebellious. I was spoiled. I, You're very precocious. <laughs> that's a, well, I think I was just kind. Of, I like to play. I love playing. Yeah, who doesn't love playing with their kids? Exactly. So that was you. You did manage to focus later on, focus your studies. But you also, um, you talk about a great deal of love within your family, but also quite a bit of hardships happening there in those formative years. Um, in your family, you were exposed to domestic violence, fighting between your parents and your father's temper, and also your mother and your, your half-brother Andre, they suffered enormous physical abuse at the hands of your dad. And I'm wondering, what was that like for you as a kid, growing up in that environment? I was mostly playing in order to avoid it all. In the book, there's actually a, a section about um, my mom trying to uh, escape the, during the Sino-Japanese War. Um, because at the time, Japan was invading China, and it was touch and go. And there were Japanese soldiers looking for a flower woman to rape, and uh, how she ran from town to town. So that part was also uh, important to capture. And of course, uh, it was difficult. But I, I mostly got involved in playing. And I was the gang leader in the, in the neighborhood then. Your, your reaction was just to like dive into childhood and try to not, not to, to hear all that crazy dinner around you. No. Yeah. How do you think it affected you growing up in that place? Um, <coughs> we were very middle class in Hong Kong and um, I was too young to really had much of an impact. I think it was later on in my teenage years that that was really difficult um, because 
my dad had a car, and, and, and he was an opera singer. He, he was a school superintendent. My mom also was a teacher. Uh, I knew there was something that, was, that wasn't quite right, but, um, but it was mostly after we came to Canada that my things so really came up. Well, you're going to be reading a passage about your time moving to Canada, and I, I'd love to be able to talk to you about some of those sort of adult realizations that you made growing up in that family. So would you read a part of your the passage that you're reading today in your book deals with, with the time moving to Toronto? Is it like? Sure. Now, because aging means that I might not be able to read those print, Right, like so, I printed a bigger version, <laughs> make a font bold. You know, um, yeah, okay, you understand. All right, thank you. <laughs> it's not even one, you know, paragraph. It's uh, big space in two paragraphs. My mother spoke very little English, but my father spoke fluent English, and I had studied English in school. I had another advantage when orienting to this new world. I had grown up watching Batman, Bucks Bunny, Mr. Ed and the delightful Roadrunner, and the less than aptly named Wiley Coyote. Not long after we had settled in Toronto, our family moved to the newly built high-rise neighborhood of St. James Town. Just south of Rosedale, Toronto's most affluent neighborhood. I was still the tall boy who used to arm wrestle the boys and sometimes win. One thing I did not do was bring my friends home, for home, more than ever, was a tempestuous place. The move to Canada was supposed to give us a wonderful new life. But like many immigrants, we experienced setbacks and shocks. My father, the former school superintendent, and my mother, the former teacher, suffered a dramatic decline in both income and status. My mother worked as a maid and later in the laundry department of a hotel near City Hall. The first job was tough, the second one tougher. From working in all that humility for decades, my mother developed arthritis, which worsened as she aged. When she finally retired at the age of 65, after all those years of toil, my mother's pension was a lump sum of just over $3,000. Later in my political life, I would come to understand the importance of a good pension plan so that seniors can retire in dignity. My mother's own story would become a powerful motivating force. Now I wish I could report that when my mother finished her grueling shift, she found respite at home, but there was none. My father could not find a job teaching, though he was qualified and spoke English well. There wasn't much work for him as a substitute teacher. He tried pursuing a master's degree, but it didn't seem to make any difference. He lasted a year delivering Chinese food at no pay. Then he worked for a few months as a taxi driver, but found he couldn't understand the rapid fire dispatch orders. He worked occasionally as a laborer, but he never found a niche or made much money. So he was increasingly frustrated and bitter. Worse was the violence. My father had been beating my mother even before I was born, but these beatings now escalated as new strains and pressures flocked from earth. In that eighth floor apartment in St. James Town, faced with disappointment and shame, his fury boiled over. The paranoia that had emerged back in Hong Kong now manifested itself in new and terrible ways. Again, another born but. This was a period in my life of great loneliness and great shame. For us, no help was forthcoming. 
I did try speaking to someone in the guidance department at Jarvis Collegiate, where I was then a student, but that got me nowhere. My mother couldn't speak English, so she couldn't seek help either. Like so many immigrant families, we were on our own in the new land with no relatives or friends to help us. I think back to those times, and I wonder how much differently things would have gone for my parents had there been comprehensive support, counseling, and psychological help beyond what my father got in the hospital when the crisis moment had already been reached. Olivia, it's a very visceral, difficult journey that your family had from China, from Hong Kong. I'm sure many people can relate to that story. What was that like for you as you were here and becoming aware of this growing mounting conflict within your family? How was that for you to be around that kind of escalation? Well, it was difficult, as I said in the book, but there was a little escape. When I turned 16, I saw this ad, Junior Forest Ranger. I said, okay, escape. So I applied and I got in. My mother said, what, going up north? The entire summer? Not a chance. I was, yeah, yeah, well, I was only three years in Canada, you know? You're gonna live somewhere else except home, a girl. I went anyway. And then all of a sudden, I saw stars. Because in St. James Town, you can't see any stars. You just, you know, look up and it's lights, there's, there's no stars. I saw the sunrise and the sunset and the beautiful, majestic sky and the, and the forest and the lakes and the loons. I fell in love even with the black flies and the horse flies and the deer flies and the mosquitoes. Even they were lovely. It was just amazing. I saw this beautiful, majestic sky and I, it just put everything in perspective. I am just this small. And it just put all my trouble uh, into, you know, just in that spot. Also, at that same time, I managed to uh, find a church. I was, uh, a friend of mine said, check out this church. And then I found this whole notion of the power of unconditional love. So that was my second home. I went to church, I taught Sunday school, I studied the Bible, and taught Sunday. Yeah, it was just a second apartment, though I can't sing at all. I don't know how I managed. So, in, in the face of adversity, you have a tendency to just find other places of beauty and other places of inspiration. And then in the home front, I mean, it was still very difficult, and I was struck by the story of your half brother, Andre. Um, he is a fellow who had a very hard time, and yet he always just returned to you with a great deal of love, because you were, you were very much the apple of your father's eye, and Andre could have become jealous, could have become, you know, angry, could have really resented you, but he didn't. What do you think you learned from Andre? Uh, he's a sad Buddhist, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's about living in the moment, about not looking in the past. And that's, you know, unfortunately, I mean, it, it made it much easier for me dealing with grief later on to look at the moment, to, to understand the here and now, and not just look at the past. And uh, he taught me how to meditate, uh, he taught me much later, not that when I was a kid. <laughs> Uh, and um, he was he was just uh, taught you some kung fu. Moves. He taught me some kung fu, you know. And I, then I went and took judo and to defend myself. Was how did the two of you turn out so well, given how crazy that home life was? What do you think it was? It, it's uh, you know it's not that different from a lot of immigrant families. A lot of that different from a lot of families that are struggling. A lot of families that don't have a whole lot. One thing that I learned during that period is the value of hard work, of saving every penny, 
he has his uh, yeah, pennies, not I don't have pennies anymore, but you know, St. Mary Penny, or rainy days, and also about um, thinking about others, because um, during that period also, you know, talking about love, you know, to love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself, and loving your neighbor also means volunteering. So in the book I talk about uh, volunteering and the crisis intervention unit, um, dealing with people that have uh, attempted suicide or preventing people you know, to commit suicide because I understand how difficult it is when you're trapped in, in uh, turmoil, emotional turmoil. And you're always finding a way of turning it around and, and serving and taking that, that difficulty. And even now, you're, you know, it's like it's not that heavy, this is what we're talking about. It's like, okay, it's happening. You seem to be able to see what happened between your parents, with your father, you give a lot of um, understanding, lend a lot of understanding towards very big upheaval and, and um, not great, the greatest behavior by, by any means that certainly your, your parents were exhibiting toward one another. And I wonder if it's mental health. We, we don't talk about mental health enough, right? We don't, we don't deal with it as much as a society. We have patchwork, very fragmented services. Just even uh, two weeks ago, I had a meeting with all the frontline workers and work of new immigrants, newcomers. I asked them if there's one service that they need to expand, what would it be? They all said mental health, and a service um, uh, support, counseling support. And uh, which is one of the reasons why I want to talk about domestic violence, uh, male violence against women, about mental health, about how we can come together. Because the book is really, it, it's, I don't want to depress people about all that. It's about coming together to make a difference. Because I know there are some people here in this room that have done so much um, to support people that have mental illness, to support newcomers, to support people that are homeless. Um, because that's the power we have when we come together. Your politics are very much intertwined with what you have experienced in your life. And I'm wondering, how did growing up in your home, how did that inform your political perspective? Like, how are you, you know, could have just run away from it. You could be walking around and very, very wounded by what has happened, but you're trying to turn it around and trying to use that as a place to begin to talk about some of these things that you just mentioned. How do you think it was that you were able to take what was difficult and turn it around? What do you see in your father that made you forgive him, that made you turn it around? He was sick. He was sick, right? And also, um, I try to imagine, I guess maybe the artist in me, I try to imagine what he would have thought, what he's, he was going through. The bitterness, the frustration. Rage. Right? Yeah, the frustration. Rage, right, of course. And I try to imagine, and I, I push it up and down level, I try to imagine if it's someone like the father or, or someone that cannot speak English, if they pick up the phone to call 911, and they can't tell someone on the phone, the operator, that her husband or her mother or her daughter is choking or not breathing or that there's a fire going on. She can't communicate. She paid taxes. Why should she be able to get that kind of emergency service support? So I try to imagine what other people are experiencing, and then I thought, wait a second, that's not fair, I need to do something about it, and thank God I have some friends that also agree with me. And then we start a little campaign to say, you know, to the police service board, hey, 911 needs to speak 140 languages. They said, oh, go away, forget it, too expensive, no, not a chance. I said, well, no, come on, yes, you can do that, no, well, then you so, won't. No, I didn't volunteer. Not a chance. I I don't speak Punjabi or you know Portuguese or Italian. No. So um, I started a petition. I was a school trustee. I knew nothing about the police service board or metro council. And um, I went to a lot of 
frontline service agency and said, this is a problem, yes, it's a big problem. Do you think you can get a petition going? Yes, absolutely. I went back to the police service board and then I said, look, if the operator can figure out what's going on, uh, the, oper the, the officer walking in would know whether there's a person that has a gun or not. It's good for the safety of the officer. Oh, and by the way, uh, if there's a fire, the, the fire department would come, firefighter would come. It helps save money, it saves lives. Why don't you do a report? They did a report and thought, oh, okay, it actually saved money. All right? It, it, because originally it thought it was going to cost them an arm and leg. But uh, the service got started and yes, it continued and it saved money and it saved life. So but it's, it's all that imagining. It's empathy, I guess, in some ways. It's just, if I'm going through it, other people are going through it, if other people are going through it, surely we can do better. You were talking about your um, love of nature <laughs> through um, turning to nature in, in difficult times, and also religion. I mean, I, 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 um, I'm taken by the, I, I often think that politicians are hard to interview because they don't really want to talk about their personal life, let alone their faith, and yet it's really a big part of your book, the fact that we're here in this church launching your, your book. And in the early formative years in Toronto, you were introduced, your parents weren't necessarily religious, but you were introduced by, uh, to, to the church, the, the Toronto Chinese Baptist Church by friends. And you said that, that um, there was, a, was there in the church that you were able to learn about the power of the collective. Can you tell me what happened there in the church that made you realize what was the event that happened that made you see that power of the collective? Uh, it wasn't in the church. Uh, the, well, you know, you can have faith, but you don't take action. Then it doesn't mean anything. Uh, so, uh, in, in the 1979, there was the Vietnamese boat people. They were adrift. And my friend, Dr. Joseph Wong, is here. Uh, <laughs> started. So we need to do something. We have to do something. Let's do a rally. We had a rally at, at Range Park. It was pouring rain. I've never been rallied before. I, I was an artist, right? So I went to the rally, and then there was this Operation Lifeline. We came together, and we got the government to say, yeah, okay, we will open the door if the Canadians sponsor uh, these refugees, then Canada will then also allow the refugees to come into Canada and wow, I thought all of a sudden I saw that when we came together, we had the power to make a difference. And then on top of that, that's what government is all about. Oh, okay, they can change laws, they can do things, they can help save lives. So I was beginning to figure that out and um, one thing led to another. Um, I became politically engaged. And that was, uh, well, that, that range park was directly the office of the church I was, I was going to at the time. But it, it's, um, if you ask me about faith, um, there's this mystery, and, and it connects, and jumps ahead again. We don't know how, I mean, there's something about wilderness that lifts us up. Yes, we, we are this small. But we also, uh, we have to accept that mystery because we don't know when we're born. We can't tell when we're going to die. So when Jack passed away, I was not angry. I, psychologically, I understood that this is what faith is about. It's understanding that mystery, it's accepting it, uh, accepting that, uh, that his life and my life we lived it to the fullest, and sometimes love can be, that moment can be so incredible. It's, it's a fullness of time. That, that moment or the time that you spend is so beautiful or so rewarding that it's like eternity. 
And that once you experience it, the time is not necessarily linear. Okay? It can be multidimensional. Uh, then, 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 yeah, okay. I have lived a very, very full life in Jack. And um, I don't look at my past. Just, well, yes, those are beautiful memories. But I try not to think that, oh, I can't have those experiences anymore because that's rejected. But let's be grateful for what we have. And, uh, and move ahead and, and just continue with it. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, I'm going to go back to that time, early time in Toronto as you're growing up. Your parents did eventually separate. You moved out with your mom. And before you met Jack, who was such a huge part of your life, you were involved with a couple of men who were physically abusive towards you. What do you think attracted you to these fellows? Maybe I thought subconsciously that violence is normal. I don't know. Okay. I've seen that. So maybe, uh, so this is the cycle of violence. It's incredible. It took me a while to leave. And every time I tried to leave that relationship, that's when. Uh, you know, at one time, that one, uh, I was not killed, and then I don't get it. I went and got in love with another guy. Didn't quite work out as I was leaving. That happened again, but thank God by that time, my Ferrari was pretty you know, good. Myself. Yes, take me home. Um, so, no damage in the second time, but it was like, wow, what is this? What is happening? It's the cycle of violence. I mean, it's, it's, um, that's why I went to, later on to teach um, in George Brown, where I started a woman uh, counseling advocacy program to, to talk about uh, men's violence against women, why is it acceptable, um, the root cause of it, it's about power, it's about perception, and how we need to shift from that. And for you, was it like you were um, wanting to help them, or did you find that you were, you were feeling like it was your fault, or you, what, what was the oh, mindset that was keeping you in those relationships? <laughs> I was uh, under the illusion that, oh, if you love them enough, maybe they will change. I don't think so. What was, the, what was the thing that made you break the cycle? That made you get out of those situations? Guy is a loser, just leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easier said than done, okay? Easier said than done. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're getting beaten up. It's yeah, like, yeah. oh, geez. But you did come to a day where you're like, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Yep. I left. What's amazing to me is that despite all of your family dysfunction, you still hang out. Your pox, your mom goes over sometimes and visits him. Andre visits, as opposed to building walls and, and blocking each other out, you still kind of are together as a, as a strange little family. So how do you think you've been able to foster that relationship with them? Um, I'd like to bring Jack in on this, um, <laughs> because I shared a lot of years with Jack. Um, we were very, very similar that way. That if you see the goodness in each person, no matter how bad that person is, well, most people are not bad human beings. They just have flaws. But let's look at that good part and look at what we can do together and how we can touch each other's that kindness and that goodness. Then, and when we connect that way, we are so much happier. We can do so much more for each other. Um, I used to be a lot more cynical and pessimistic. One thing about hanging out with a guy that was forever optimistic, Jack Layton, <laughs> unbelievable. There's not one theme going with that guy. You know, he can stand up in Parliament and, 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 and just, but he actually, gets along with all the people that he, you know, it just, anyway, he's just, he's just really a good person. He turned that cynicism around. He, yeah, I mean, so I used to, 
listen to all the music that has minor chords. So there's always yeah. sad and pessimistic. There's always the major chord guy, you know? It's like, yeah, unrelentingly. Unrelentingly optimistic. optimistic. And it just rubbed off after all these years. And I said, like, okay, all right. That must have been so nice to have. It is absolutely wonderful. And Jack's mom and his uh, brothers uh, are here. And our kids are here. Thank you for coming. And of course, my mother is here. I thought I would give a shout out to them. That whole crowd is a very nice time. Yeah, that crazy freakish optimism. Yeah, it's, it's, that it's amazing. It's amazing. It's just it's contagious, I tell you. Yeah. yeah Lucky you, is. after that string of bad nuts. I know, I right? It's amazing. <laughs> okay, we're going to um, talk more about the more recent past and the present, but right now I want to loosen things up with a series of rapid fire questions. These require Really, just a knee-jerk reaction from you, Olivia. You can say the first thing in your mind that comes to your head, and I'm just going to like motor through these questions. Okay. So number one, if you were in financial ruin, what would you never sell? I'll sell everything. There's nothing that's. It's just possession. Who cares? Okay. What's the first thing you noticed about? People, uh, what's the first thing you notice about people when you meet them for the first time? Their eyes. <laughs> what about their eyes? Pardon? What about their eyes? Their eyes. You, just, you look in the eyes. It's, you know, they say it's their soul. I don't know. It's beautiful eyes. What's the last thing that made you laugh so hard? Milk or some sort of fluid squirted out of your nose? <laughs> So we were brought down many, many levels down. You know, Eaton Center, there's like deep, deep, deep sub basement. Were you in hell? And it, it, it was all this what we have. It's just concrete, small room. And we were given these cards that we have to fill out, asking me about my name, you know, name address, blah, 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 nationality. Is it Canadian? No. Where are you from? Uh, I said, pardon me. And then we said, you know, I'm not going to fill this up. We're going to call the police. I said, okay, call the police. The police came, recognized Jack Lake and Olivia Chow, and said, you two get out of here. 
So, just for kicks. What were you doing? No. Were you running to the fountain or something? No, 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 no. Because at that time, young people were systematically harassed. And that, even center that spot, because he was the city councilor at the time, that area was public space. There was a, an agreement between the city of Toronto and Eaton Center. That space was made public. In fact, he was barred and he was charged. And, and in another incident, he went all the way up to Supreme Court. He won, uh, and the space is supposed to be public. So anyway, long story short, uh, barred, barred in the Eaton Center. What's under your bed? My bed is a water bed. Oh, it's yeah. not even. That's right. It's right. There's water. It's crazy. A water bed is a very yeah, interesting it's, detail. I know it's a. Uh, What's up with the that, water bed? I, yeah, that was when Jack and I met. We thought we we need to buy, you know, we're getting married. We need to buy a bed. The, the water bed was in at that time, but we believe in safety things. So I still have that. And very adventurous. That is a very, that's a high dose, very separate things, okay? How many of you have water beds still, man? Eh? <laughs> uh, how many no one? What's the last thing you do before you go to sleep? I read. I love to read. What sort of books? Right now I'm reading uh, Barbara's King Slover. Before that I was reading Margaret Edwards' latest book. It was great. Um, and I don't Okay, so what is the first word you use to describe yourself? Oh. Oh. Oh, see, oh, child, I don't know. Uh, first word. Why well, asking you all these difficult questions? Uh, I don't know. I don't try to describe myself. Okay. Oh, that's, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so in your book, you write that politics should be enjoyable and not a chore. Yes, it's a lot of fun. Yes, and that Jack had this knack for finding everything fun and making things fun. So I'm wondering what's one occasion that highlights the way the two of you could turn a political drudgery into a good time? That time when we were debating Adam's mind, where uh, we want to truck all our garbage and dump it up in this mine. It was a really beautiful lake. This is the garbage mine. This is the garbage mine. We send all the garbage up there. We send, we want to ship all the garbage up Norman, just out of sight, out of mine. That's the way to do it. And we had a political battle. And see, Mike Layton has an entire collection of Simpsons. Thank you, Mike. So, one night we were thinking, it was just before we, um, the council was debating the issue of Adam's mind. And Mike said, hey, you know, I know the exact story. There is a Homer Simpson who was the mayor, and he wanted to ship all of his garbage to a mine. So instead of me speaking at city council that one day, we played Simpsons. <laughs> Over. How did that go over exactly what the response you just got? And then the mayor was not happy. <laughs> Everybody got distracted. And um, you know, the, the moral of that story is that after they buried, you know, it was after Homer put all the garbage in the mine, they, uh, it started popping up. And then they left town, and it's the uh, people of First Nation that. Uh, were left with the mess, um, so uh, it was very appropriate. So anyway, that was quite fun. Do you think Homer Simpson and playing Homer Simpson helped to address the mine and the garbage situation? No, that was a collective. There was a whole group of. Uh, there was a people themselves that came from the north. It was their their campaign. We were just backing them up, right? Okay, so there is room. You know, it's, it's never just the politician. We're just the conduit. Um, it's the people rising up that makes the difference. We don't, it's, exactly. It's nice to know that there's some wiggle rooms at the city hall. We can play some, some tricks like that. Have some fun. It's fun. So one of the uh, hardest moments that you write about in your political career was when you ended up losing for the second time. You ran for MP of Trinity Spadina and lost for a second time to liberal Tony Ayano. 
by 1.5% of the votes. And I'm wondering, you know, it, it's not a bowl of cherries, so what does Olivia Chow do when she is in the dumps? What kinds of things do you do when you're bombed out? Find uh, the nearest kayak or the nearest oka to hang out with. Get away from people. We went, um, we went sea kayaking uh, in Vancouver Island and uh, we hiked in the old growth forest. Uh, I listened to Joe about mystery, about um, Joe, Joe, Joe. Yes, in, in, in the Torah or in Bible, it depends on the you, Judeo question. You said you listened to him or read him? Well, because we wanted, we were taking long drives, so we brought an audio oh. tape, yeah, on the blog, and that's well, we Joe, were Joe speaks. I, I know, there's just not a lot of people when they're driving in Vancouver Island, but this is a joke. This is a joke. <laughs> My audio book begins. So that's the secret, nature and Joe, you know, to counteract these bummer times. And now, your mom is a huge person in your life. She's amazing. And um, I'm wondering, you still live with her, and what does she say to you when you're moping? I don't mope. You never mope? I go swimming instead. Oh, yes. Yeah. We know that. I'm a swimmer. Yeah, we're both swimmers. You're much better than I am. Well, I always remember, you know, when we were doing some research for the Jack movie, um, that uh, you told me you swam and swam and swam and loved to swim, and you said something, and I'm not sure if you let it slip, but you said that when you're swimming, nobody can see your tears. Yeah, except your goggles got all fogged up. <laughs> well, it was really difficult, because Jack and I used to swim a lot together, right? And then I was swimming alone in the same pool that we used to swim in. So it was really difficult, I'm sure. But um, something about exercise, something about being in silence, and we can really work out the soil, the frustration, the stress. Um, I used to be in the budget committee, um, and uh, I was at the same budget committee with this fellow called Tom Jacobek. Uh, some of you know about him, okay. Why are they booing? I don't know, but uh, anyway, we, we did have balanced budget, okay? Balanced budget, I, as I said, I could work with every, every, it doesn't matter, people of different political stripe, you know, Mal Bosman, I was a children's advocate being appointed by him. But anyway, I digress. So every, there are some nights after budget meetings that I was so much stress, I would put an extra 10 pounds in the black hole down in every, weights that I'm doing, you know, the triceps and the biceps, biceps and the triceps, yeah, the other thing, <laughs> tricep, biceps. I would add extra pounds just to work out the, uh, the, the frustration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, okay, so I'd go back and do battle the next day, and uh, it's amazing, you know, just uh, no pain, no gain, that's, uh, my, my philosophy sometimes when you're with it. You are so, so yeah, so no moping for you. You just head to the gym, head to nature, head to Job. Um, you, your mom then, like when you're having hard times, what is that like to coexist together? Like how does she sort of help you through these times? Or are you both just very practical and just like living together? Practical. Just do the work. Just get it done. I like those to wait. Eat. <laughs> Good advice. Um, you know, you're talking about the power of people working to change, working and coming together, not taking any sort of credit, but sort of trying to mobilize people to, to um, come together. And one thing that you write in your book is that you've noticed and you've seen that people are less, they're participating less, in part because families have less money, time, and more debt. It's um, the reality right now in terms of recession and hard times. So what do you think is your solution? What's the solution to this in, in the face of decreasing participation or, or mobilization? I think the Canadians and or Torontonians are incredibly generous with each other, right? Where there's ice storms or the Filipino, uh, the uh, typhoon in the uh, Philippines or Haiti, an earthquake. We're very, very generous and we, 
we, we volunteer in a lot of things. Our report and what type of things. Young people are volunteering a great deal. So people do care. It's just that somehow uh, the political system, the people that are in charge, you know, some, some politicians, want us to be cynical so that we would just leave things alone. They don't want us to change the status quo. They don't want change. And some people, because they are struggling, because they, they feel that they don't have the power to make a difference, then they said, ah, politics, all dirty, uh, economy, money, I don't know enough. I don't want to get involved. And to overcome that, that feeling that they can't make any change, the best way is to start really small, win a few things, celebrate, and then the minute we can do a few things together, people notice that they do have the power to make change, especially young people. And then they said, aha, this is how we can do it. I just look at my life, right? It's part of the reason, the reason why I wrote the book is to say, look, here I am, immigrant kid, just like a lot of people, um, never took political science in, in university, got involved because I just want to make a small contribution, and here I am, right? It's, so the book, a lot of it is immigration, it's about adversity, which we talk a lot about, it's about public service, how would we come together with the power to make this change, to make the difference? And about love. It's a lot of love affair, love stories in there. We were talking about earlier um, the crazy, amazing optimism that, uh, that Jack had and that he and you shared, and he sort of changed that cynicism within you over the years. But what I have noticed about the two of you is a very quick um, encouragement. And, and sort of, even when we were making the film, like I was playing the role of you. You could have been extremely controlling, but you weren't. You just sort of said, do what you want to with this role. It's, it's sort of, it seems to me that there's, it needs to start from inside a person to be able to say, hey, what do you think? What do you think? What do you want to do? And you two have really had that, that attitude. I mean, it's very easy just to go, no, 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 I want to keep on this, you know, as opposed to like, encourage. Yeah. Well, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> Why worry about small things? It doesn't matter. I'm very blessed to be able to say that, you know, you're saying that you and Jack are not really big warriors. How the heck, I mean, you're dealing within a world of politics and high stakes and so forth. How do you not worry? Well, we're... There are other people <laughs> that can do the worrying. That's what a team is about. I do, you know, I do want to make sure things work out well, but there are other people as part of the team. So it means I do worry so It's like a bit of relinquishing of control. You can't do everything. So I try. Except the book, yes. Except the book, yes. Your book closes with a few very emotional chapters. You and Jack were very determined politicians, and at the apex of his career, cancer dealt with a very hard blow. And I'm curious about how were the two of you able to switch gears, to switch gears and let, let go of your political ambitions to accept what was happening in that time? Well, we have a wonderful family. My mother with the soups, my sister-in-law with the chicken pot pie, and my mother-in-law's key lime pies, and was, you know, all types of amazing, amazing support from friends, families. Um, Jack has, has built such a strong team in, in Ottawa uh, and across the country that we know we're in good hands, especially the young people, the young people of Parliament that have been elected. And um, we we were just, uh, you know, just back to that living in the moment. You want to cherish every moment. Why, if you 
keep thinking about what's in the future or what's in the past, but we can't live in the moment. So, um, so it, was, it, was, it was quite clear that we must deal with this now, and whatever is the past and whatever was happening, we must just leave behind. Absolutely. <laughs> that's like, that's just, you experience this in such a visceral way of just mortality. This is what likely all of us will, will face as we face our passing, that we have to let go. Well, we, there's a passage that said um, that we will be done in heaven as it is on earth. I e you can bring heaven down to earth. I don't necessarily believe in the heaven. I don't think I would, you know, who knows, whatever it is. Right? Um, but if we can make the earthly life, I do now, here and now, everybody's life, my life, your life, and everybody's life, as heavenly as possible, then, uh, then that's what's most important. Right? So it's not about having a beautiful life afterwards, it's about having the best life we can have now. And making other people's life as best as possible. So in the book, there's lots of stories about my work as a children's advocate and, and young and youth advocate, starting new programs for young people, for children. And, and, and as Jack and I, during that period, um, occasionally thought back of all the work we've done, we celebrated those kind of work. Those are great. But we also know that there are a lot of other people out there that can carry the torch. And, and uh, in some ways, Jack's death touched people in a way that said to all of us that we have this goodness inside us. We have that power to make a difference. And we are capable of making great change. That we can um, make everybody's life as heavenly as possible. So having that belief makes a huge difference. So that notion of <laughs> so that notion of public service, public service in a very intimate setting is just service to one another. Yeah, you just every moment is very precious. We've always lived that. You describe um, in, in, in the after after Jack's passing, you threw yourself into making lists, arranging Jack's funeral. You wanted it just perfect, and we saw you conduct yourself publicly with great poise and great care. And yet, behind the scenes, things were a little bit different. Now, in in the book, it all begins with a toothache that caused your face to swell up. Can you tell me what happened when? Your best friend, Nancy Tong, took you to the mountains um, away for a few days. What happened? Oh, um, I always wait until I have time to do medical stuff. Uh, I have a gigantic toothache, so I didn't do anything with it. So after the funeral, I can pull my teeth out. So, to, to, so uh, actually, so I went to the dentist, pulled the tooth out, so I was like going around with a gigantic. Yeah. Anyway, that was what it was. It was. Um, um, you write. You write that um, in the in the mountains that you had had a breakdown that you didn't remember very much of it at all. Nancy ended up telling you. Yeah. But so there's the sort of public face, and then behind the scenes is is finally life and your emotions are catching up with you. Oh, of course. Of course, yeah, so um, I do remember now, but it, it sort of didn't exist. Mm -hmm. and of course, it was really difficult. It was just, yeah, um, I had panic attacks. And I found the best way to deal with that moment of deep sorrow. Oh my God, it's about to take over. It's taken over. What am I going to do? I don't know what to do. My heart is beating too hard, too hard. I'm freaking out. You know the best way to, to deal with it, I found? My, my my friend taught me to grieve, right? But also, um, 
I figure that if you do routine stuff, routine, have a routine, a ritual, it really make a difference. So I make the bed five times. I clean, yeah, I normally don't make beds, but you know, I make it bed over and over and again. So you just, just overcome that period, you know, that maybe a few minutes or an hour, you can say that, okay, if I'm okay in this period, I can then move on. And I pick up my Blackberry, I try to do something, try to distract myself, and then you write a book. I, yeah. <laughs> I write a book. Yes. And there was that period where you ended up getting pneumonia, then shingles, your face got paralyzed. Even looking back, thinking about the thyroid cancer, you put it off, put it off, put it off, until you had to do something about it. So what do you think it, your body was trying to tell you as you were going through these um, I worked too hard. Um, I didn't listen to my body, yeah, but not completely. Um, have, you learned learned to, back. have you learned to wind down? A bit more. <laughs> last year was quite, yeah, last year was, yeah, it was pretty intense. Last year was, did the sculpture, got the film done, got the book, um, had the memorial, Jack, and the Jack Lee Ferry Terminal, plus being an MP, and yeah, it was pretty intense. But this year is going to be really relaxing. <laughs> Seems like the board decisions probably your recovery as well. Then. In what ways do you think your political perspective, yes, has been changed through all of the events in the past three years by what we've been talking about today? What's inside your book, having to live with the loss of Jack. How do you think your political perspective has changed from all of these events in your life? Um, the perspective has not changed. The, uh, the principle is still the same. The values are still the same. Um, I'm not sure there's any dramatic change. Um, it's. Um, Maybe I should pace myself a bit more um, because I don't know how to pace much. Because when when I have a partner that I can just go and relax and hang out, it's a bit easier. Uh, now I just work, right? So I need to. I have to slow down, find the balance. You know, hang out with the kids and the grandkids and the family. Go see a movie. Yeah. At the same time, you you sit before me with a couple of great legs. <laughs> you're fit, you're cut, you look great. So, um, uh, but then I get sick. <laughs> My last question to you, Olivia, is: um, In the absence of Jack, physically, where does he exist for you now? Ah. Uh. See, some journalists ask that from, from myself. But anyway, um, where, where do I go from here? Does, does he exist around you? Does, do you feel Jack? In ah, where, does it, where does Jack exist for you? Uh, in beautiful memories. Um, and uh, where does Jack exist? It exists as a, as a, um, a spirit. And I think many people exist. As there is a spirit to, to, to say that, that, it, that there's much some, something that's much bigger than we are, and that uh, it's, a, it's something that would constantly remind us to um, live our life to the fullest and be happy. And don't worry so much. <laughs> Thanks for working out. So it's like his spirit. Yeah. Spirit. Now, this book, as um, I know we talked a lot about Jack, it is he's very central in it. But um, in some ways, there are several sections in it. There's sections about immigrant families, about overcoming adversity, as I said. But there are a lot of political stories about how we can come together and how we can win small battles. And there are stories in there about uh, winning that 
budget that we got from our uh, the 4.6 billion, the NDP Jacqueline budget. There's stories on that. There's a story on uh, the coalition. That, uh, and, and so there are some it's really, it's really tied in there, the politics and the, and the personal. And the personal. Well, yeah. I mean, it, at this point in time, you know, it's a very interesting political landscape in Canada. And from your perspective, you've seen the changes that the NDP has undergone and, and the evolution over 35 years. What do you think is the most surprising transformation or change it's undergoing as a party today? As in the NDP? Yeah. Um, no one ever doubt the NDP could form government anymore. It used to be when uh, Jack Layton gets in front of a podium and said, I'm running for prime minister, people were going, oh, what? what? Um, I think he, the, that hopefulness um, that you can uh, become, uh, well, form government in 2015, uh, is, I think people are now saying, yeah, that is possible. So that, that's a huge change. But more than that, I think there's, putting that aside, um, it, it, there's one big story that I think we need to, and uh, that I want to leave behind tonight, is that um, we were able to break through in Quebec because we said to Quebecois that uh, whether you're in Quebec, outside Quebec, we are together. Whether we are in the downtown Toronto, in the suburbs, we're one city, we're one Canada, we're one people. And that theme of working together is so important to be united together. Because some people like to divide us, to say that we are here, we're there, we're different, I'm an immigrant, you're not, I experienced poverty, you haven't. That divisiveness is so destructive, and, and that part that if there's, if you ask me about that spirit, if that spirit tells us that if we work together, we are so much stronger, and, and that why did we, how come we got through to Quebec? Why do they give us a chance to be, you know, outside Canada a chance? Travaillons ensemble, it's about working together, so that has always been my style, that this very much part of the theme of the book about coming together. We are so much stronger when we come together. Thank you all for being here. Thanks very much.
be aware that uh, this is just the Toronto launch. Tell your friends across the country, Olivia is coming. There the, this book is launching across the country uh, with Harper Collins and Olivia as well. Uh, folks, if you want to still uh, sit down, there's still uh, programming to be done. We're about to introduce uh, the next act uh, for your enjoyment here at Trinity Bellwoods Church, which is an amazing venue. Uh, all right, it's time for Jada Man, a hip hop artist, a workshop facilitator, a trailblazing advocate for marginalized communities. In 2008, his first single, Anything, was number one on Flow 93.5 and 93.7 WBLK radio stations. We all know Flow here, I'm sure. Jada Man is a youth advocate in his community working with esteemed organizations. So many of them. He's got NIA Center for the Arts, Art Starts, Toronto Community Housing, the Black Daddies Club, and Cypher Writers Collective. In addition to all that, Jada Man's life story has been chronicled in former Toronto Mayor David Miller's book Witness to a City in 2010. And he's also been the recipient of the Canadian Urban Institute's Local Heroes Award in 2011. Jada Man's EP, Life 13, is being released very soon, uh, but for now, before that gets dropped, he's coming up with his crew, and they're going to do a couple of tracks for us, for performance. Here's Jada Man. Huh? Yeah. You still here? Okay, um, okay, I gotta do this fast, okay, but parking meters and stuff like that? Alright, so I'm going to bring up somebody to assist me with this song. She goes by the name of Crystal Chance. Miss Crystal Chance, can you come up with me, please? Now, there's a process in life, an evolutionary process called change, that we all must endure, and we must adapt to successfully transition our change. So, this is only fitting that we do this song. It's called The Change Don't Come. Let's do it. <laughs> 